Understanding the universe in Dikernauts is one of the most challenging tasks of any book I've encountered, and I would expect this statement to ring true for anyone else who wades into this world. It should be no mystery at this point that for today's episode, I will be reviewing Greg Egan's hard, hard, hard science fiction novel, Dikernauts. I'll start with mentioning that I recommend this book for anyone who loves science fiction and is really, really smart, especially in geometry and quantum physics. If I were more intelligent, especially in those realms, I would have gotten even more out of this brilliant and unique novel. If you want to know what you're getting yourself into from the get-go with Greg Egan's Dikernauts, let me share with you how gravity works in this universe. In the Dikernauts universe, the appropriate law is this. If we add up the second rate of change of the gravitational potential with respect to each space-like coordinate and subtract the same quantity with respect to the time-like coordinate, the result is equal to 4 pi g times the density of matter, where g is a constant that describes the strength of gravity. Still with me? Unlike our universe, this universe comprises two dimensions of time and two dimensions of space. Be prepared to wrap your mind around falling uphill, light traveling only in certain directions, rivers flowing into the sky, and characters who cannot rotate or turn around, but can only walk forward or backwards, east or west, or sidle, shuffle sideways, north and south. This is an almost insane setting because of the complexity of our simple human minds to track. Egan meticulously, and to me, beautifully explains and guides us through this world. Before waiting too long, I need to state emphatically that Dikronauts is fit to be read. It is as close to a must read as I will allow myself to declare something a must, because anyone who truly loves science fiction and wants to explore every corner of the genre will find that this novel occupies a realm all its own. Dikronauts, in many ways, will not resemble anything that you've read. One thing I will not do in this review is pretend that I can challenge any of Egan's science or depictions of forces, gravity, axes within the hyperboloid, and any other directional math. As fantastical and surreal as the physics of this world are, I imagine Egan could effortlessly sit through and answer rigorous grilling on the mathematical principles and accuracy of physics anyone might question pertaining to this universe. Lost in the idea that this is a very complicated and difficult read is that it's a great story with an interesting journey, mind-bending adventure, and very interesting characters. The journey is of course a device to allow Egan the opportunity to show us all the interesting things he's come up with for this dynamic and inventive world, but it's also an interesting trek for us. The main characters in the book are Seth and his cider Theo. Seth is a walker, meaning he is a seemingly humanoid individual who is upright and capable of movement, walking forward and backward to the east or west, and is able to shuffle sideways, north or south. Sidling, as it's called, is dangerous because of the potential to fall toward the north or south, which I'll discuss in a moment. Walkers are born either east-facing or west-facing. Seth's alignment is east-facing. This means Seth's most natural, limited field of vision is to the east. He's capable of seeing to the west as well, which would require him to tip his head backward. If he were to try to rotate to the north or south, his body would just elongate along the landscape, incapable of ever rotating even minimally south-southwest or north-northeast, and a fall in either direction would be even worse. Egan, on his very helpful website, notes that rotating in this world is the equivalent to the attempt at accelerating to the speed of light in hours. Fortunately, like all walkers, a cider inhabits a tunnel in Seth's skull. Theo is Seth's cider. Ciders see or sense using a sort of echolocation. Because the cylindrical shaped symbiote cider threads through the walker's skull, his field of vision or perception is to the north and south. Working together, Seth and Theo maintain a complete field of vision. Seth relies on Theo for seeing, or echolocating, known as pinging, to the north and south. Guess how Theo does this? Of course, he uses his pingers. Theo relies on Seth for ambulation and sustenance, 
Theo feeds off Seth's blood supply in his brain. If you read or watch a lot of science fiction, symbiotic or parasite storylines will come up. More often than not, the plot will include separating the host and parasite as a goal, or perhaps an origin story where the symbiote relationship is novel and both parties learn to coexist. The symbiote relationship in Dikronauts is unique, and instead of a story that focuses on what to do about it, the connection between Walker and Cider is natural and it's the accepted state of existence in this world. The explorations of the relationship and witnessing the interaction between Cider and Walker is one of the main and illuminating pillars of the story. The symbiote relationship is fascinating and it will focus on who takes precedent, how they will deal with tension or conflict, how each contributes, and how they will consider their individuality, their family, and their future. The relationship is not presented superficially. There is much for us to consider, including questions like, what if a cider and a walker don't get along, or they want different occupations? What influence can a walker or a cider have over the other's autonomy? How does romance work if two walkers have chemistry and the ciders don't, or vice versa? I mentioned the journey previously. Seth and Theo have become surveyors. Their world is not a sphere, but a hyperboloid that is orbited by a small star. Additionally, the star has an uneven or tilted orbit that makes much of the world uninhabitable. Because of this, the population is constantly migrating to find new habitable areas. As surveyors, Seth and Theo, along with a small group of other surveyors, seek out habitable areas. If they find a potential new location, they will take measurements and readings and they'll report back to their city, Baharabad, so the city can be moved. To borrow now from the publisher, but when Seth and Theo join an expedition to the edge of the habitable zone, they discover a terrifying threat, a fissure in the surface of the world, so deep and wide that no one can perceive its limits. As the habitable zone continues to move, the migration will soon be blocked by this unabridgeable void, and the expedition has only one option to save its city from annihilation, descend into the unknown. Interesting in the story is that these characters seem to know as much about the shape, features, and laws of this unusual world as we do. The story introduces us to a number of different types of characters and interesting obstacles along their journey. There are questions of morality, philosophy, conflict, action, and lots and lots of complicated geometry and physics. It bears repeating. Dikronauts is one of the most compelling and fit-to-be-read science fiction novels you will find. It bears mentioning, I'm about to get all spoilery up in here. Like number one, the beginning is haunting as we start to grasp the concept of the symbiont relationship between the walkers and ciders. And we get this spooky moment where Theo is directing Seth that his sister Elena was harming her cider, Theo's sister, Irina. They enter her room and find her skull bandaged and covered in blood. We find out that Elena was pregnant and Irina decided not to be. This moment really sets the tone cultivating our curiosity toward the Cider-Walker relationship throughout the book. Like number two, the series where they're collecting unknown and unusual fruit from a difficult-to-climb tree with intertwined branches, the unpleasant smell they flee from and cannot trace is discovered to be the result of consuming the fruit. Consuming the fruit causes the eater to dislike the smell of the tree, causing them to flee and thus spreading the seed further away. This is a really creative mention of botanical evolution. This also is set up well paragraphs earlier during a brief aside, mentioning trees with limited fruits that were very high up. Subtly, it was noted that because the trees were root migrants, they had no need to make anything edible to lure animals to spread the seed. Egan trusts that we get the lesson in tree evolution and it sets up or foreshadows the smelly tree moment rewardingly. Like number three, the vortex river they come across is very compelling and it really is part of the story where we get to survey the land along with our main characters. It's fascinating because it's as if we're discovering this world and its surprises with them. We're not just seeing a snapshot of a universe that a creative author has built. We are along for the ride and we're really exploring with Seth, Theo, Rana, and all of the others. Dislike number one. There are parts that can be boring because instead of describing what two people are doing, Egan tells us what all of them are doing all of the symbiotes, what their position is, 
where they're looking, etc. It's interesting, but it's also cumbersome at points. It's a bit of a chore when you have four people together because you're really keeping track of eight personalities. Even in these parts though, it's hard to call it a dislike because I have to say, there are still nuggets of very interesting things and descriptions that come out. The interpersonal relationships definitely add value to the text. Dislike number two. For the first half of the novel, there's such a hostile tone among the characters when there's a conflict to resolve. I consider that it could just be an intentional trait of these characters, but I don't think so. It feels like the author's voice and that voice seems to deal with any conflict with antagonistic response. Dislike number three, the steam lands. I feel like I'm supposed to be more spooked or impressed by them. Unfortunately, the steam lands evoke no sense of despair or panic in me. Does this hurt the story? No, not at all. I just happen to take note of it. Like number four, the symbiotic device is very unique as it played out throughout the story. As I mentioned earlier, parasites and symbiont relationships are not novel ideas in science fiction, but in the other instances I've witnessed, it's been about how to figure out how to live together and coexist, or it's an acute situation requiring a resolution. In Dichronauts, we begin and end the story with those relationships as just an accepted element of the story's landscape. It really allows us to consider so much of the broad concept as well as the nuances. The inclusion of the Thantonites and Dahlia supplements the representation really well. I find it particularly interesting when Ada is willing to make the sacrifice to stay with Dahlia and the Southers. This is the seemingly moral calculation, even if it's motivated by Ada's guilt. This juxtaposes nicely with Seth and Theo's previous moral high ground that was related to Ada and the Thantians and their use of the puffballs. Like number five, the political consideration. The places it took my mind are of my creation, of course, but I'm left wondering how much of my impression was of Egan's design. One part that really stands out is when they meet the residents of Phanton. There are many implications to how they assess the locality as a potential site for migration. They consider the political aspect of negotiating with the residents. Because they believe the Thantonites are treating their ciders immorally, some of the surveyor party actually hope that the Thantonites resist because then they could actually have a reason later to subjugate them. Also later, there's a brief discussion about allowing the Thantonites to still remain where they are if they change their ways. Some of the surveying party scoffs at this idea because it suggests the immoral treatment of ciders could be left to a voluntary action. We also can go further down the rabbit hole with other potential scenarios. That the story held enough interesting parts, including politics in the mix, elevates this story even further in my regard. Dislike number four, perseverance. Usually if enjoying a book means you have to persevere, there's going to be some acknowledging of that in the dislikes. At times, the reader just has to persevere in this book. There's so much that the reader has to just hang on for. Especially when Seth is on the river, Egan has a great concept and it's clear that he knows exactly what's happening in the story that he's written, but at times, I feel he's at fault in writing what he's understanding, but forgetting that he's leaving something out for the reader. We need a little bit more to see the same thing that he's seeing. I don't think it's a matter of the reader not catching on. I think it's a bit of missing information in the description. There's a lot in this book to digest and try to visualize, and for me it was okay to not see everything, but to just persevere through the tougher spots. We can still see the story unfold, even if at times we can't visualize every part of it. Curiously, I toyed with including this as a like, you know, the idea that persevering was welcomed. That's quite a feat. There's enough legitimacy though to qualify this in the dislikes category, and I already took a lot of time to try to edit down my many likes to just five, so we'll keep this here in the dislikes. Dislike number five, north, east, south, west. I'm curious if there's any other science fiction that uses those words as many times. In a way, the use of these directions is impressive and necessary. At times, it can be dense and redundant. Bonus like, the genius brain that is Greg Egan. There are a small number of books that force me to use my brain as much as this book does. Sometimes that can be a good thing, and sometimes not. This book is an example of the former. Reading Egan, you know what you're getting into, and if you're in the correct mood, it's easy to appreciate the brilliant story, and it would maybe be unfair to criticize its challenges. I think in natural criticism, some readers 
may have for Egan, especially if they're new to Egan, is that the novel is maybe too science dense. I don't share this criticism, even if I understand and appreciate it. I think even with the hard, hard science, Egan would have liked to push the alternate physics further, but in his benevolence, he deferred to our less advanced brains to bestow his brilliance and to also allow us to experience the beautiful stories, curious characters, and exciting journey. Thank you for watching today. Please comment, like, and subscribe. Sidle on over to the notification bell as well. Ping on that. And then YouTube will let you know every Thursday at 1 p.m. when I release new content. Thank you.